what is Mr. Beast? He's he's still seen as a creator himself, and his you know whole brand is a media company. So. That's been one thing that's been a little disappointing. Creators are not currently seen as business. You can have 10 million followers and they, they still see him as a consumer. And it's it's because again, they don't own their audience. You know, modeling, it's, it's the same as anything. If you go into a casting, the casting director might not like the shape of your eyebrows. And, and you have no idea that that's why they don't choose you, right? Oh, but wow. with social media, it's true, there's weird stuff. But in social media, you can kind of see what your audience resonates with and what provides the most value to them and, and value in the form of inspiration or entertainment or whatever it may be. Over time, you make your luck. The more you work towards it, the more options you build for yourself, the less luck you need, if you know what I mean. If someone becomes a billionaire at 21, 22, I'll be like, stroke of genius or incredible luck. Give you a sense, oh, I love your shoes. Thank oh you. my goodness. <laughs> I love me a good a pa pair of loafers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's humid though. So it's, it's I as I stepped outside today, yeah. I'm just, Sticky, so oh uh, yeah, might end up changing them. We'll Ra see. Raining and stuff. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for doing this. And very last minute, because I think it was like last week. I was like, okay, let's do it quick. Yep. Um. So you're are you are you from you're not from here from Austin? Because uh, I had um AJ mentioned that you're um visiting him. Uh, are you going to be at Sastok as well? Yeah, yeah. It's actually why I came out here. It's it's my first time in Austin. Um, AJ was speaking at the event, invited me out, and I'm on a conference tour. So. uh couldn't turn it down. Conference tour. I yeah. love that. I love that. Well, we'll talk a bit about why you're on the conference tour there in a go. second and what the strategy is with that. But first, uh, maybe a quick quick introduction of who you are and what is it that you do? Yeah. Do I? Yeah. Well, the conversation is, be is <laughs> okay. between us and gotcha. uh, and look, this is a genuine introduction because I do very little to know digging into my guests. Because when you tell me who you are, like I am genuinely learning about yourself, so yeah. it makes it more like an, an authentic conversation, getting to know each other. Okay, nice. Yeah, so uh, Gabriel Padilla, um, you know, I'm a social media creator turned founder. I had moved to Los Angeles when I was 16 from a small town, doing modeling, and uh, found that you needed to build a social media presence increasingly. So uh, you know, I, I decided to figure it out. I've always been into numbers and marketing. And so I figured it out and then I had friends that were also artists and, and uh, entertainers and, and businesses as well that were kind of feeling the press of social media. This was back in about 2016. Um, so, you know, started helping them for gas money or they'd buy me lunch. And then uh, obviously if their friends ask, if they're, you know, that's how it kind of mm -hmm. spread and I'm not going to charge them gas money. So I uh, built an agency. And so I've done that for the past eight years, um, you know, social media marketing for creators, artists, um, you know, brick and mortar businesses, e-commerce. Uh, we actually did our own e-commerce brands in uh, 2020 and did very well with it. Uh, we did seven figures without uh, any Facebook ads, any emails, specifically through DM. And so, oh, wow. yeah, we realized a, uh, there was something there. So then I built a DM conversational marketing agency and we've really helped our clients a lot, um, generating a lot of revenue specifically from their, their organic content. So zero ad spend. Well, I suppose that the fact that you're coming from the social media um, background, you learn the ropes, out, as, as they said, with, with what works and what not. Um, that helps you with building the same type of, I would say, success for your customers. Yeah. Is that what you're, um, that's how you developed your, your agency and, and those parts. You know what? The one thing that I would say is when you told me, social media influencer turned founder entrepreneur. It, to me, that sounded like something that happened recently. But you've been having your agency for eight years now. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I was initially when I was turned, okay, so the, you, you, you've been into doing social media and content and so on for quite a while. And recently you started your business, but no, you've been, you've been doing this for, for eight years. Yeah. Now, social media agency, Loosely, I think it wasn't a, you know, I'm going to form the LLC and, and start a business today. Again, it started with helping friends and, you know, realizing that I could charge for it. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to overcharge. And so, again, it was just gas money and I was getting them thousands of followers a month and then boosting 
you know, their engagement, getting a lot more eyes on their account. And then as I connected with bigger and bigger clients, um, you know, we were able to do that. But, but it actually was, I would say, more recent when, not to say I completely stepped away from being a creator, but if you look at my Instagram, I haven't posted in a few months. And the reason being that I found it was, you know, very difficult to use my audience and actually build a business from it. So the e-commerce business we did on um, my agency, anything, you don't see that on my Instagram. Because, okay. you know, travel, lifestyle, some menswear kind of stuff. I, I didn't know how to take the attention from my social media and turn it to, you know, customers. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was more focused on other people's stuff. And then more recently, you know, I found that, you know, there's, there's a way of doing it. That's why we built the software uh, platform. We launched the, the new agency where we help people specifically take that attention on their social media and, and turn that into podcast viewers or, or customers or email opt-ins or whatever it may be um, because that was actually something that was really difficult for me was I, I did always want to be a creator but I've always been an entrepreneur since I was you know like eight years old lemonade stand the basic um, did well at that <laughs> for an eight year old to be honest um, but you know it, it, it was always a thing where I was kind of wrestling with where I'd focus on my social and then my business would struggle and then I'd focus on my business and I wasn't really able to do the two so that's kind of the the mission I would say I've, I've not formally stepped away, but I've really put my focus on building our company Ellipsend so that we can work with creators and make it easy for them to, you know, take their audience and put that towards building something they love and not having to separate the two like I did. Right. Okay. So it, it kind of stemmed from, and, and it's a platform, you said it's a, it, it's a piece of software that yeah, you up as a product. Yep. So, and it stemmed from your own challenge of being like, well, how do I marry my audience with a service or a product exactly exactly and it was it was a common problem i had you know and when we build audiences a lot of times businesses would be, say you know this is cool i have all these followers mm -hmm. but uh how do i know that this is actually going to make a real impact and even as a creator you know i went to uh jamaica recently with a uh with a pr agency and uh you know when when i post on on instagram and i'm you know this awesome trip at jamaica with this resort uh there's i'd say zero percent of my 300 plus thousand followers and be like I'm gonna book a trip right now to Jamaica you know yeah. it, it's uh that's a common problem that I was seeing kind of in the space that you know creator agencies were unable to kind of show their clients the direct impact everything's like CPM and, and kind of more esoteric or you know nebulous uh you know benchmarks um so it, it really kind of goes all the way from the top to you know very large enterprise Netflix you know kind of same thing they they don't aren't really tracking subscribers from their posts um, to to creators, to small mom and pop shops, you know, actually getting people. My parents have a restaurant in my my small town, and it's it's very difficult to actually leverage your social media. So um, yeah, yeah. So how do you do that? Tell yeah. me a bit about your software, like because yeah. uh, now you made me curious. Like, how do you take that esoteric uh, numbers and uh, transform them into tangible? Yeah, yeah. So I think the best way of explaining is kind of you know how social media is treated now. It's it's almost like you know you go to Times Square and you see a billboard for coke or whatever or let's say your podcast and it's like go to my podcast you know subscribe to my podcast you have no idea if that billboard location is better than the others or if you know anybody's actually seeing that and going to it you might find that you're getting podcast subscribers but if you have 10 different billboards or whatever it's very hard to tell so social media is kind of the same thing where you know people say like go view my podcast streaming on all major platforms you know and it's you know from from a attribution perspective you know, tracking the actual conversions of the customers or other people who are clicking the link, going to your podcast. It's very difficult to see which posts resonate so you can create more content like that. But even if you look in the way the algorithm works, you know, retention is such a huge thing on social media where if you post a minute long, you know, chop up of your, your podcast and you said in the caption, you know, go to the link in bio or go search it on here. If someone watches 10 seconds, they exit away from the content. That's telling Instagram that, hey, you know, the retention is low. Yeah, that this is bad content. So even if you have all of these followers, whether you have like, you know, 100, 100,000 or, you know, 5 million, uh, very small, small portion are actually going to be, um, you know, directed or they're going to be exposed to your content. And then it's going to be even worse if you're trying to push some kind of off platform. So we saw that as a problem and that, you know, it's not a very good user experience because also if you're, you're swiping through reels or something, you know, it's uh, it, you don't want to lose your spot on the reels page. And so a lot of times you just won't do anything. Um, so instead, uh, you can actually set up, and this is, you know, through their API and everything like that, 
Um, so very like Meta is really pushing messaging. So you've probably seen it before where if someone says like comment podcast or, you know, this is episode 43, uh, you comment 43 and right away you get a DM from be your account or whoever's account right, yeah. it says here's the link to it. And, and by doing this, not only are you, you know, increasing engagement because you're incentivizing engagement, mm -hmm. you get a lot more comments and a lot more organic reach, but also you can track that, hey, this post got us this many clicks to our podcast. So we're doing this for, you know, for creators. And I already have, so our, our marketing agency, which I launched actually last year, the DM marketing agency, we, uh, we work with some bigger names, Danny Morrell. He has a big podcast. He's about like 1.7 million on Instagram. Uh, we just, we just uh, signed Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi's company last week, oh, really? mastermind.com. So yeah, we've, we've gotten kind of proof of concept. And, and again, we generated, you know, about a million dollars in revenue in a year through doing this. So that's why I decided, you know, the, the current solutions available um, are, they, they don't, really make it easy for creators to do and it's not very trackable so we decided to build our own okay well interesting so what's the what's the next step with um mr tony robinson's agency now they, do you help them is it like it's a kind of like oh well for certain profiles and certain influencers and so on you handhold and help them set up and such or you just give them access to the platform and you know yeah yeah so with you premier scaling is, is my marketing agency so we're using many chat which is which is great like we're an agency partner i spoke at their event last year it, it's solid but you really need an agency to set it up it's not something you can right. you can you know set up something basic but actually managing it and optimizing is, isn't something you can do yourself um so right now we're, we're building those campaigns for oh there's some thunder yeah, we're having yeah. this conversation over proper storm in in, in austin yeah. <laughs> really right. Yeah. Memorable, right? I was asking yeah, which, which exactly, the most yeah. memorable episode. Let's hope it's this one. Exactly. Um, yeah, so so we're actually creating a lip send, so it's you don't need to hire an agency to do this. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. You can schedule content and post content through our platform, set up a very simple DM flow where if people comment or they DM you, they get a message, and then you can actually track exactly how many people click the link and how many people start conversations yeah. from it. You know, um, so the, we're launching today, actually. Right, so I, I get that, but what, what I was asking is like for... If let's say you have a very high profile mm -hmm. um, customer, like a let's say an influencer, very yeah. high profile influencer, would you go through? Would you basically go beyond means and beyond means, above means, mm -hmm. whatever the saying is, and help set them up and say, oh well, here's some ideas of how you could use our tool, and here's some strategies and so yeah. on. Or is it strictly, here's the platform you have, and usually you have your marketing yep. um, team and uh, and strategy and so on, and you use it the way you want it to, or do you also help them with figuring out what would be most effective way to use your tool? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So entirely selfishly, we are working very closely with people who get started with our initial users, because, you know, if you uh, now we're getting the founder talk, which I'm excited mm -hmm. about startup yeah. stuff. Um, you know, it's so important to know your users and see how they use the platform. And, and the idea behind it is that we want our users to be able to sign up for free because, you, you know, you get started for free and you only have to pay if you actually get a lot of growth from it. So we can grow with our clients and you can set up your first post, your first flow in about five minutes intuitively. And so we're going to be working very closely, giving strategies and everything like that, kind of helping more creators do this. Um, and like I say, very selfishly, because we want to know our creators more under, I, you know, we're going to, right now we service, you know, Instagram and Facebook, we support them. We're going to be building towards X, also Twitch. Uh, I don't want to build Twitch if uh, we don't have people asking us for Twitch. Yeah. So, you know, I want to, if our, if our users say, hey, we would love this functionality when we post, um, or we want to use this platform, then we can build around that, you know, uh, intelligently, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really good to know. Um, I, I was curious, I'm, I'm actually quite curious about your content uh, creator slash influencer journey so you said at the beginning that you moved to LA yeah, yeah. where from Oregon. Oregon southern Oregon okay yeah. small town so wh why was it because you were you started cr creating content back home and then you were thinking but wh how did you move to uh, modeling LA? I was doing modeling back then Right. Um, so that's what moved you to LA. LA. Okay, exactly. Okay. So it wasn't like, oh, oh, you're a content creator and... No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really influencers and now creators weren't really much of a thing. Like there were a few, most like the bloggers back then. Zero percent on my radar to do, you know, social media in that way. I, I kind of, 
it was, it, I had to, if I wanted to do modeling. And that's why right. I then found that social media gave you so much more freedom than, than modeling did. I mean, for one, you can make more money. And for two, you can kind of run your own career as opposed to having to kind of work with your specific agency. Yeah. Um, so that's why I chose that path and kind of left modeling behind. So basically you bumped into it because it was a need for your modeling career growth. And then at one point you stopped and said, Exactly. This exactly. Actually, I like this better than than modeling. Yep. Yeah. It was. It was so much better. And I mean, it's you. You get to kind of connect with your audience immediately. Um, I think that was something that was really big for me. Is, is you could actually see the, you know, modeling. It's it's the same as anything. If if like in in that industry, if you go into a casting, you know, they might the casting director might not like the shape of your eyebrows and, and you have no idea that that's why they don't choose you, right? Oh, but wow. with social media, it's true. There's weird stuff. Like it's very particular stuff, you know, maybe the way you walk. Um, but in social media, you can kind of see what your audience resonates with and what right. provides the most value to them and, and value in the form of inspiration or entertainment or whatever it may be. You so know? you don't get that into modeling. So like, for example, if you're going for a casting and there's five models and they choose one, they never actually tell you why, as in like why they chose that model. The only feedback I ever got was the feedback from a casting director on a job I'd worked with before who said, the reason why we didn't choose you this time is because that guy has more followers than you. Only time I ever got any, any, any meaningful feedback. feedback whatsoever. But I suppose, do you reckon it's because when it comes to people's looks and such that it, it's, I don't know, it, it's just not natural for people to, to say, oh, I don't know. You, you I was hoping eyebrows. you would say that actually. No, that they were ruthless. They would absolutely, they'd tear you apart in the room. Um, it, there, it's a weird power dynamic that I found in modeling uh, where they would love, where it's, you know, like you for a good looking guy, you take care of yourself. Women, of course, go through it as well. Um, and, and, you know, not to say that there, there were some incredible people I met in the modeling industry, but oftentimes I found in, in the casting department, you know, the power dynamic of like, this is a good looking person. I can just twist the knife. You know, they all knew we were, we were uh, trying to get skinnier and better shape. And so, you know, I look, my agency even would, would tell me that I was like, oh, you're too fat. And like, you know, I look different now than I did before. But back then I, I now look at those photos and I was like, man, I was like sub 10% body fat, easy. And uh, yeah, no, they, they didn't pull, pull their punches at all with uh okay yeah <laughs> so there were there was feedback right as in like in general like oh no you're too fat you're too this you're too that I, i'd say feed not constructive feedback right and that in it like, was like that's not we didn't choose you because of this yeah. it was just they would like to kind of I, I think part of it was they thought if if they wanted to keep their models on their toes mm -hmm. so they would feel like they kind of need them for the feedback and then also just you know not letting them get comfortable and always you know, I would say that there, there was some benefit in that because I was always, always progressing. Um, but I think it did really affect my relationship with food and with fitness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was more of an obligation. It wasn't fun anymore. I was working out, you know, twice a day and and uh, eating quinoa, ground turkey uh, and asparagus. And that's it, you know. Um, so, you know, good with the bad. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way when there's extremes are never good, is it? No. no. So, uh yeah, if it, if it makes you fall into that extreme of, well, you know, I need to be top 1% um, of their roster or whatnot or yeah. on job um, um, success rate for modeling gigs and so on, then you might go to extremes in order to, to keep you there. Yeah. And that's never good. I don't know. It doesn't really matter what industry, right? Or what, yeah. even health wise, right? You, get fitter, better, and so on. But I don't know, there's, a, there's also a mental um, component uh, I mean, in the middle of it, uh, which is, you know, if you're trying to be way too healthy and look way too good, yeah. then you kind of like remove some of the, you know, joys and some of the things that keep you sane. Ab yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I will say that my roommate back then, he would, uh, he would eat, he was permanently shredded. Like for him, fitness was not like, at least staying very lean was not hard. He would eat like pasta, just boiled pasta. He wouldn't put salt or even pepper because he thought that it would, you know, like obviously salt, you can retain water, whatever, mm -hmm. but pepper, he wouldn't put like, he would just eat 
pasta. And uh, I mean, it, he, it seemed not hard for him. It was interesting. He was, some people are just like that, you know? I, I wasn't, but uh, <laughs> we're living in Miami. You know, my family and my father's side comes from Cuba. There was a bunch of Cuban food. So I, I was in great shape, but uh, I did have some balance, I think, despite all the, the craziness, you know? That's good. And, uh, and also you realized, I hate this. Um, I prefer social media. Yeah, and you know what? This is something I, I don't actually think about too often, but it just brought up the top model in the industry. Great looking guy worth all these brands. Made about a million dollars a year. Right. So to think that like the top of the top of the top in this industry, which, you know, is, is unrealistic. It, only the, the ceiling was so low yeah. and you'd have to put up with so much to get there. You know, that was the thing for me was, uh, you know, I, I think when I when I realized that I, I had not to say I, I care to necessarily make more than a million dollars a year. That's not really my driving force, but just understanding the, you know, where the, the money ratio. is, you yeah. know, like there's the impact. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So the top of the top, like the best male model would make a million dollars. So that yeah. means that if you're ranked, ranked, whatever, yeah, yeah. like six <laughs> or yeah. something like that, you'd make pennies. Pennies. Yeah, it, it really was. And, and the other thing, too, is, is uh, I, I connected when we were living in Miami. We lived at a model apartment um, and there were a bunch of Brazilian dudes that were really big into modeling. Like he used to be the, the face of uh, Armani for like years and years and uh, they'd go to the beach and like everybody oh my god male models male models and again like that that's not what I'm after by any means mm -hmm. um, but they would fly out first class to amazing destinations and like you know 20 2016 20 ish uh, you know that that for 2018 that kind of period was you know e-commerce was kind of really rocking so like you don't fly to the Bahamas in a first class like they'd fly to Ohio you know and you'd go to a warehouse and in front of a white background and like and then take another shot you know like the the magic was gone too yeah. so it's like what, what am i doing you know um and so the money wasn't there anymore because people were kind of all getting into modeling and then you know the 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 energy i guess is the way i'd put it just the you know the relationships were not the best and and yeah so social media provided a lot more so on social media what what did you start so i suppose you started social media because of your modeling career and you yeah basically posting posts around your modeling life and um and shoots and so on but did, did that continue once you kind of stopped with modeling that type of content or did you move into other type of content tell me a bit about how, how you progressed like what were yeah. your evolution in social media yeah there's there's definitely been some uh some whiplash for my audience for my content <laughs> definitely a lot of modeling stuff and decidedly not modeling stuff anymore um you know it was modeling and and travel you know my girlfriend and i we lived uh she's from finland so we'd live in finland and we'd come back to the states and live in you know different areas and we lived in mexico city for a little while so a lot of travel we've always loved traveling right um and fortunately having the agency has enabled me to do that you know on top of doing some trips as, as a creator as well um, so a lot of cre uh, travel and then also menswear, um, but nothing crazy because, you know, I, I'm, I, I wish I had that incredible taste where I could have like seven different pieces and rings and everything. And that, that's never been, you know, my, my vibe. I think, you know, what I was going for is, is accessible but elevated, you know, kind of menswear where just if you want to look good as a guy, like without right. breaking the bank too much or like you can invest in quality, but without like constantly thinking about it, then uh, yeah, menswear and then, you know, fitness and, and travel. Okay, and that do, do you still do you still do that now? This this content. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'll do some travel stuff. The past few months with with getting ready to launch a lip send. Like I said, we're we're launching today, so it's been a big run up of, of just preparing that. By the way, congrats! Um, like, thank you. You so you're launching a SaaS stock. Uh, yeah, basically, assuming that you know, we <laughs> use the API. Like we're not doing any any automation weird stuff. Mm -hmm. So like we uh, we just need Instagram to to approve the final permissions to send messages, and then we're live. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you have good. some sort of lo launch party or something like that? That's so right, right here. Yeah, oh, there you yeah. go. The whole week <laughs> is, a, is a launch party. Where's the party <laughs> boppers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean the way we see it is like you know I'm just I'm just excited to work with more and more creators. Um, so it's I'm not you know we have a wait list. We have I have a community where I you know teach on a school, which is a cool platform like how to do DM marketing. Um, but it, it not any grandiose like launch. It's more just like hey, we're live. You want to get started like let's yeah. let's fix your problem specifically I, I don't want to have a lot of startups will have a big bump and then um, you know if they even get that big bump that that launch and then uh, you know the quality is not there and for me I'd rather 
you know, the YC's whole thing is it's better to have, you know, 10 or maybe 50 users who love your product and, and would, would chop off their arm for it than 1,000 or 10,000 that are ambivalent. So that, that's kind of what we're looking for is like when we work with creators that the light goes off and I don't want to see that, you know. Um, so yeah, we'll party maybe once we hit some milestones, um, but I, I'd say revenue milestones for the creators, you know? Yeah, well, that, that's the right attitude to have, to be honest. I'm not having a conversation earlier about a very similar thing, which is like, you know, feeding on that, on that um, reward that you get as a founder, as an entrepreneur of helping someone else, yep. which is quite important for a lot of us founders. Sure, I mean, there's, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that also start and are driven by the financial gain of it yep. and primary the financial gain by all means. Yeah. You do you. Well, for me, and I think for a lot of other founders, and especially when we talk about SaaS and, and software and products, um, social media products and so on, it's just that ability to, to help as many people as possible and seeing their reaction of, of, of helping. It's, 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 it's a personal satisfaction as well as, you know, it's, of course, you also get more successful and more financially exactly. stable. It's a it byproduct. As, yeah, it's exactly. a buy, it's a result, you know, of, of providing impact. When you create value in a space, you know, obviously you can then, I, I believe in value-based pricing. Uh, you know, we, we leverage that a lot with our, our marketing agency. I think we can definitely do a lot more um, of, of that, but it's more like we want to work with people in kind of a new field on the, the marketing agency side. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think that it, especially with something kind of new, like we're, we're trying to fundamentally shift how businesses and creators use social media for their businesses and how they engage with their audiences too. Um, so, you know, I think that it, it's better for us to work closely with creators and, and, you know, at focus on the financial gain as it comes, you know, but the financial gain is a byproduct as they gain financially, you know? And I mean, that's a great byproduct, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I've helped a hundred thousand people yeah. and I made a couple of millions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, we're, we're raising a seed <laughs> round. So, I mean, like that's, that's, uh, where I'd say like, I, I, what do they say? Like, uh for for uh, startups like a uh, salary is like for survival and then equity is for upside so i think yeah. that's kind of my perspective here is like the market agency is doing quite well so even when we raise our seed round I, I don't expect to take a salary or a meaningful salary um because i'd rather just kind of invest that yeah. in. and I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to do that because i have the marketing agency yeah um but yeah it's, it's i'm more I, I see it as an opportunity for we can be the the mouthpiece for brands and creators to their audiences like solving that problem and, and attribution, like being able to track where as creators, like creators can say, we created this much revenue for a brand or this many email opt-ins. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, I think solving that problem, it's a big problem and there's a lot of money there. So it is because it, yeah. again, I think the one thing that we've got used to in this kind of creator and influencer marketing um, world is one of two, one, companies that brands that invest in that just because it's status quo and they have to because it's like well we're at a stage where we have um quite a lot of marketing budgets and we want to continue to sustain the you know brand awareness because that's what it is at the end of the day when you can't you know when i wouldn't say because you can you can quantify and you can track brand awareness mm -hmm. as well there yeah. are ways but most of the time when you do not have the very specific means of tracking how a piece of content from an, from an influencer or, or um, creator has in positively in in impacted your, your brand, yeah. right? You put it under brand marketing, right? And brand recognition and so on. So there is a lot of big companies and companies generally that do that because it's like, well, you know, it's our quota. We have to continue to yeah. invest in brand recognition because, you know, it has its return right your brand is always mentioned and appears in a variety of content right. but then there's also the other side which is uh brands and usually this is startups and smaller brands that try they realize that it doesn't either they don't have a way to track properly how them sponsoring uh, an influencer actually helped them either that or it doesn't give the results that they initially thought that they wanted. Yeah. So they never do it. 
Yeah, okay. nothing nothing will humble you more when you have hundreds of thousands of followers when you uh when you post something to your podcast or product or anything and you get like no one. <laughs> like like yeah, basically like yeah. that's it's it's humbling and discouraging. And especially because a lot of, you know, creators and and you know, public figures, whoever, even businesses, like they invest so much time and energy into building their audience, but it's like everybody knows you don't own your audience if uh, you know, they're not on email or SMS and whatnot. But but even so, I think that, you know, you can have 300,000 plus followers. And that was always a big thing for me where like, you know, when I got started, unbeknownst to me, people, everybody was buying fake followers in the beginning. And, uh, you know, so many people I mean, that are still, still, oh yeah, of course. But like now they've kind of, you know, because the algorithm didn't punish yeah. them so much back then. And, and I'm not necessarily like throwing shade on it. I've, I've never done it and I don't recommend, you know, I, I, I don't really feel great when creators do it, when they work with brands um, to inflate their numbers. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that was a big thing in the beginning of, you know, a lot of people did that. And then they had huge, huge audiences that were attractive because it had chronological posts. You know, it wasn't like so much like, you know, they limit your reach in the same way. So that actually helped them build authentic following. So it was a small percentage. And, and that's the frustrating thing I always, you know, struggled with was what's the point of investing all your time and energy into building this audience? instead of buying fake followers, if your, your content's not being shown to, if you're not able to activate, you know, like your audience anyway. Um, and I think, I think a lot of creators share that frustration, um, especially because, you know, creators can, can buy fake likes and fake impressions. They, they can fake those metrics. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, I wouldn't say PR agencies are complicit, but I think the current solutions don't really allow for, there's like AI and stuff like that that can scrape audiences. Um, but I've, I've seen that like work where someone I know they bought a lot of their followers, um, cause I've worked with them and I know they, when they talk like, yeah, we bought a bunch of our followers. Um, and then it says like, yeah, a very authentic audience and people who are very authentic have, you know, where the, it says that it's not an authentic audience. Um, you know, I, I think that solutions don't really exist to kind of track for that. And that's the problem with social media where, yeah. you know, brands and PR, ag PR agencies, for example, I work with brands and even influencers, like, you know, the metrics that you show to prove your value, followers, likes, even comments, impressions, um, you know, uh, every saves, every DMs from it, like just the DM metric, all of that can be faked to, to fraudulently present your value. Um, I think that's kind of the problem with the industry specifically is there's, everybody's kind of, you know, put their hands up, right? Well, and, and I understand why you're so passionate about what, what, what you do, because Basically, being able to, for influencer to go back to brand and say, this is how much money I made you, right? It's like, yep. he, like you've, we've collaborated and I made you this much money. So our collaboration works. Yep. So let's continue to go uh, to, you know, diversify our kind of like portfolio of, um, of partnerships yeah. and so on. They do longer term, that happens a lot. You'll do, do like yeah. a pilot project and then, and a lot of times brands will do that just to get your first, you're like, Let, let's do, can you do like a very discount rate just for the first one? If it goes well, we'll use it for a future project yeah. and then you never hear back from them again. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And, and just the other day, I was, I was just remember, remembering now, I saw on, who was it on, I don't know, I think I've seen a piece of news on TikTok where, mm -hmm. There's, there was this, this family, this couple, actually it was family, they had kids as well, and they faked their social media, and it seems to be a very common thing, they faked mm. their social media success, and that they, they were a travel content type of um, yep. couple and family, where they bought a lot of their, their audience, yep. and they were posting these pictures and videos from holidays saying that thank you this brand yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. sponsoring <laughs> yeah yeah and in reality they were paying for the trips yeah but, but they were doing this in order to build a profile yeah. in order to get actual brands to to pay them to say well oh well this brand paid them to go on a yeah. on a holiday trip and like sponsor their um their posts and so on well yeah. we should sponsor as well yeah and that to me feels so so wrong. yeah yeah and very wrong so that's why i understand in a way why you're so excited about this topic because you know mm. being able to say the gig is up right yeah in a sense and say well there's now tools that y you can and and brands should adopt as a standard to yeah. say hey 
Yes, we'll work together, but I want to make sure that I get these kind of reports that are created yeah. with trusted tools exactly. so I know how much the this collabor collaboration contributed rather than taking it at face value. Well, that person has a million followers and seems yeah. to be going all around the world, seems to be sponsored by these brands. And well, it seems to be working. So, and this, this is one of the things, and I've heard a couple of marketers the other day talking about this and saying, you could, you could sell this kind of service or this kind of things to this, this um, type of companies because they don't check. Just have enough followers and have yep. enough engagement to your post and they'll think you're successful yep. and they'll pay you sponsorship. And even more so, I, I, uh, not naming any names, but people who I've known in the past would specifically Photoshop. They had templates on Canva oh, where no they would plug way. in and they would, yeah, they would just Photoshop there and there's no, there's no checking. Like it's, and it's, it's again, like brands just haven't really cared, I think, because they, the issue is there's no accountability. When you're a PR agency, you know, what you're delivering to your, your, um, your client, the brand is impressions, is number, and also talent. Like, look, we got this talent to, you know, post. And I think there's something to be said where, you know, somebody who has poor engagement, but has a good name, like, you know, there's value there in, in, you know, like the perception of, of brands. Um, but the, the interests are so out of alignment where, you know, brands want to be getting money and they want to see how much actually money we're making agencies you know the money they they're like well we we obviously aren't going to get money because obviously it takes a few touch points at times to do it or the, you know, the, there's no real call to action whatever it's all for brand awareness top of funnel um and so they're gonna kind of turn a blind eye right if if uh you know creators they're 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 not incentivized and i don't think they should have to be incentivized but they're not incentivized to trust and but verify kind of thing you know and then creators at the same time are like they're not getting paid for the value that they actually bring as far as like sales so they're you know again it just creates if you can put interest in alignment where that that's the hope is that creators can say we generate this much value and so this is we want to get a cut of it for example if i go to jamaica and i work usually hotels don't pay so if anybody's watching this and you see people traveling hotels very rarely do they actually pay but you you know they fly you out and you have an amazing time um so if I, for example, uh, you know, work with this hotel and I post about it and we use Lipsend and then, you know, they get their email or, the, you know, they might book right away. We provide that path six months later, which is more likely than someone booking right away to purchase, you know, be able to track that back to me as an influencer. And then I could say, and creator, I think, I was actually scolded at a, a creator economy summit last month. I said influencer and uh, the yeah. creator now. There's yeah, a stigma. yeah, influencers don't like to be called influencers. Yeah, because there's a stigma, I, I get it, because there, there is, but sorry, I got totally subtract. But anyway, <laughs> as a creator, I could, you know, get, get commission uh, on an ongoing basis from brands I've worked with. And, and by being able to prove that I actually provide real value, I'm gonna cut of that. And again, that's kind of, we get into the value-based pricing, what we do with our agency. And then agencies could provide to clients, um, you know, look, the brands rather, we generated this much revenue, you gave us this much for this. We did not only sentiment, not only perception, not only impressions, but actual hard revenue. Yeah. And then brands can actually, you know, influencer marketing, creator marketing, is uh, 11 times more profitable, uh, greater ROI, right, than, uh, than traditional digital advertising. But it's only about like 10 to, you know, it looks at, depends on which report you look at, 10 to $25 billion a year is spent on creator advertising, where social media advertising, 220 billion. And the reason being is because, you know, it, when in marketing, if you can't track what's actually making money, then you can't scale it. You're going to get diminishing returns. Like maybe at yeah. 20 billion, you get a 11x ROI, but at 50 billion, you get a 5x ROI, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So I, I think it just kind of opens up, again, creating value for, for brands, for, for agencies and for creators and just putting everybody's interests in alignment, you know? And going a little further, your audience. Imagine Kim Kardashian posts about skins. You comment skims. You get a message from Kim Kardashian. You know, it's not her messaging, but you don't care. Saying, hey, here's that discount for skims, or this is our new collection, our exclusive collection that you got access to by commenting. Here you go. Like, that's so, such a cooler experience yeah. to, for, for the, the audience, too. So they can actually engage with their creators and businesses. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exciting stuff. So is that, is that, is that where you're, because you mentioned you're on tour. Um, now for you're going to a lot of these um 
events and expos and so on and talks um is it for the product launch yeah all in all i think you know again i've i've had successful businesses i have a good track history in, in businesses but in the startup space and mm -hmm. fundraising and and you know building I, I can do the zero to one but it's the one to a thousand that i'm i'm very excited to learn more about and especially at sas talk you know i think the the agenda is really really appealing to me um you know how to there was one that we're actually missing now but it was uh which this is worth it <laughs> just to say but it's uh i'd hope it is for you too it's uh how to get you know zero dollar customer acquisition cost how to grow so on the marketing track which is so cool because that's what we're doing is we're, we're going through referrals of we'll use affiliates you know if people kind of connect their friends um and so just trying to learn trying to immerse myself in the startup world um, you know, as compared to like the social media kind of creator world. So that I'm trying to bridge the two so that creators can have their own startups or businesses and, and uh, you know, that businesses can actually better leverage creators um, and social media in general. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. So when you go to events like this, let's say SaaS Talk, um, have you been at SaaS Talk before? Is no, it the first, first, the first time. time? And then you, have you been at other events like this already? Um, like business, uh, entrepreneurship, startup. Yeah, I was at a Cogex about oh, a week or so it. ago in, yeah. in LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was that was very fun. I definitely found more value in the networking, mm -hmm. um, personally, because again, I'm, I'm, I love relationships and I love. I had friends there that I was you know connecting to and connecting with amazing people. But I'd say yeah, this is my. I did a creator economy summit. That's where I met AJ last month. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so this is my third. This year. When you talk to the individuals that either work for brands or founders of brands of, well, let's say even software, because nowadays you're also getting a bit more um, the SaaS businesses getting into influencer marketing and so on. So when you talk about your solution to this group, not the influencer, the content um, creator group, but to this group, um, what, what are some of the comments and some of the reactions that you're getting from people, let's say that, that haven't had that much of a touch base with, um, let's say, influencer marketing? You know, it's, it's interesting because I've always felt a little bit like a fish out of water in the creator world because I'm, I'm a lot more entrepreneurial minded and marketing mm -hmm. and business minded. So I've, I've learned to, you know, speak that language, um, but, it's actually so fun for me and, and it's, you know, I'm learning to talk more concise and, and contain my excitement um, because I feel like I'm speaking the same language. So I'd say the biggest thing that, you know, uh, the, the feedback it is solving the attribution problem. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's plaguing and, and I didn't even realize how big of a problem was because I, I saw it localized to the social media creator world, but I think social media as, as a whole and even digital advertising um, you know, attribution is like what everybody's kind of trying to figure out. And there's a lot of solutions and some that solve them like pretty effectively, but it's not, you know, end to end comprehensive, the entire customer journey. Um, so I'd say that's the biggest thing. And then, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot more, less talk of, um, creator side in the, when I'm here, it's more of like, how can you service enterprise? Um, yeah. I, I, it's interesting because VCs, um, and, and other businesses, they, when I say like, yeah, we're B2B SaaS. And then if I lead with creators, I quickly found that like, you're not B2B, you're B2C. And they don't mean C as in creator, they mean as consumer, because creators are not currently seen as businesses. You can have 10 million followers and they, they still see them as a consumer. And it's, it's because again, they don't own their audience and they should be able to, but more effectively, like, or more, more accurately, their, their audience isn't portable. They, they can't, they don't currently have a way of, of taking their 10 million followers or 10,000 followers and actually putting them to something else. Whereas like if it was email or SMS, they could. So uh, that's mm -hmm. been one thing that's been a little disappointing that uh, it, you know, that creators are not seen as businesses or the, the potential and, and the creator economy is growing. But um, yeah, that's like, probably the most interesting thing I've found this past uh, couple months. That is very, very interesting because at least for me, maybe I was there as well in the early days of YouTube and Instagram and so on, but now with huge household name, even if you look at YouTube, with, you know, it's, we're talking about the most uh, notorious one, which is 
Mr. Beast. Oh yeah, like, Mr. Beast is great. That that that's like you don't look at that like a creator. You look at that as a business, and yep. I think that has shifted a lot of mindsets around around what a creator represents, right? In, yeah, fifteen years ago. 20 years ago, you'd look at YouTube and say, oh, there's a bunch of kids that are making video content for funsies, right? But yeah. like yeah. nowadays, that is that is a, a, a market with a bunch of businesses. Yeah. Um, and it's surprising to me that, you know, businesses, um, organizations, um, SaaS, B2B and so on still see creators as a consumer yeah. level type of thing. Well, it's, I, th I think the reason being, and I'm a huge fan of Mr. Beast, um, and I, I think he's he exemplified like what a creator should be um, in a lot of ways. I think the reason still is because what is Mr. Beast? He's he's still seen as a creator himself, and his you know whole brand is a media company still. So that's you know Mr. Beast Burgers coming out, and, and there's it already came out in Feastables, and and you know it's. Depending on who you ask, there's varying levels of you know how well that's that's been and you know and activating his audience. Um, you know, I think I had Mr. Beast Burger was great, um, but yeah, I still think that creators are seen as media companies at the highest level. Um, and and actually, you know, a good example of that if you're familiar with Carrot Carrot Card Carrot Financial, it's a you know credit card for mm -hmm. creators. Um, you know, Eric Eric Way is the founder of that. Um, they actually work with creators because even you know big creators like Mr. Beast um, and huge creators, like banks don't see them as like underwritable where they won't actually extend financing to them because their income's up or down or like proving income and showing you how real income, they don't even, it's not even on their radar. So it, even, even the biggest ones, like for example, Mr. Beast, you know, he's investing so much in a video, waits for that money to come back, invest more in the next ways, you know, that, that kind of like payment uh, timeline Banks are really not helping creators at all because banks don't still don't see creators as as businesses. And I, and again, I can't speak to specifically how Mr. Beast finances are. I, I don't know about that, but uh, that's a general trend that you know I think carrot solving. I mean, it's it, it, again it, in general, it's it's interesting the fact that this is still such a taboo topic, which is legitimizing content creators and influencers businesses um because again you would say like 20 years ago it would be something different but i mean there's probably so many other industries and legitimate businesses that you have a very similar model which is like you know spend a lot up front yeah then hope for the best to get the the, the result the results that you need and then spend some more and so on so and banks don't have a problem with that. Yep. Do you reckon it's just because of the, what is it that still keeps the financial system a bit shy around influencers? Because even if I think about, when we think about creator programs like YouTube, right? YouTube is a big company, it's a serious company. Like yep. if, if you're concerned about YouTube paying you, whatever you earn on advertising and so on like that, then you should be concerned about every single company in this whole country because, you know, if YouTube is not to be trusted to pay their creators and so on, then who, yeah. right? And then again, when it comes to um, brands paying creators um, for promotion, for posts, for all of these things, like it's, it's, a, it's a servicing business, right? It, it really depends on how good you are at promoting yourself and selling yourself and getting um, brand money in the door. Yeah. But then again, you can be a marketing agency and that's the same thing, right? Like how you yeah. promote yourself and how you work with, uh, with brands and so on. So why is there a difference between a creator and a marketing agency when it comes to banks, yeah. financing and this and that? I, I think there's a few pieces. I think, for one, banks have financial models that allow them to extend credit to you know different businesses that have different levels of risk factors, um, you know, at play. And you know, VC has been around uh, for 
ever. Like venture capital has always been a thing. And so they've, they've found their, their models for working with, uh, you know, a bakery, um, a law yeah. firm, perhaps, whatever. Um, and so they look at something that's still pretty new um, and, and they're not entirely sure what that looks like. Um, also, I think that, again, there's no framework. If you want to be a creator today, how, how would you be a creator today? What would you do? Step one. Well, I mean, the first step would be learning how to become a creator. Where, where do you learn that? YouTube, articles. But how do you know that the courses. person who's, who's given, of all the YouTube videos, yeah. how do you know which is the right one? How do you know that they're not giving kind of like, you're going to watch that 25 minute video and at the end, knowing that they're going to be like, and buy my course for the real secrets, you know? Yes. I, I think, let, me, let me tell you something yeah. else, right? I've learned software engineering and product development from Stack Overflow, mm -hmm. right? I, yep. I learned how to code by reading a couple of books by people, some people better than others, but mainly I've learned by doing. Yeah. And learned by, you know, bumping into issues and basically finding answers on Stack Overflow and fixing my issues and learning and learning and adapting. There's... But there's, 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 a, there's a Harvard Business School, you know, computer science 101, right? Yeah, but so no one, no one yeah. asks me for it, right? Yeah. If, if I have a business that's moderately successful in, yeah. the, in the software development world, I have a SaaS, right? And I go to a bank for a loan, more than happy to give me their, their yeah. money. They have no idea that I've learned how to, to code yeah. and how to build a business um, with, with a code base that might be hacky. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, or, of right? course. So that's what I'm but, saying. But like, take a moment and look at the broader picture, right? And where I was saying with Harvard Business School, you know, they, they, or Harvard rather, you know, they have the computer science 101 for free. You can learn that. Like they're teaching that mm -hmm. at school. There yeah. are frameworks. There is a right way. And of course, like a, I'm not technical, but I'm familiar with it enough to know that, you know, um, there is bad code, good code, and there's, but everybody has their own conventions, a way of doing things, of course. But I think that there's, there's a, there's tradition, you know, and there, there's enough of, of a framework, um, groundwork done that like, it's, it's a real thing. Like my, my CTO and co-founder, he taught himself to code. Um, you know, he, he went to community college and, uh, he now works at the Inc 5000 company and, and has 10 engineers under him hundred percent because there is a right way of doing it. As a creator, like what's the right way to be a creator? What's the wrong way to be a creator? The, there's no course, like there's no, there's no internationally agreed upon accredited course for that. And so with Stack Overflow, I think, you know, you, you can still, it's, it's maybe a, a truncated version of like a longer uh, curriculum that is accredited. But as a creator, it, it's just not as, uh, as concrete as, as um, you know, every, there's, it's changing too all the time, you know, like what, what content is good, what content is bad. The thing with monetization, um, you know, YouTube is incredible. I always recommend people, if you like, you want to be a creator as a career, set your sights on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think they, they pay their creators, you know, the best and you can actually build the, the most authentic connection with your, your audience uh, currently. But even so, like they could change like that and they did and they, they do like platforms do change their algorithms, their policies. And absolutely, you know, I, I could say a lot about like the myth of security and safety working in corporate America. Um, but even so, like, you know, it's there's no stability because also it does happen where brands just don't pay sometimes. Either they do net 120 payment terms or they just don't pay. What as a creator, what are you going to do? Are you going to, you know, sue them? You don't have a legal team. You probably are living kind of paycheck to paycheck a little bit. So it's difficult to do that. So I think there are risk factors at play because it just hasn't been, you know, um, um, made concrete or solidified rather as, as an industry yet. Okay. Best practices, I think. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, I, you know, I, in my eyes, I could, I could have the same legitimate reasons on why a software company yeah shouldn't be trusted. i mean i i agree <laughs> i am just so you know I, i'm a creator <laughs> we're, i'm playing devil's advocate here you know and the other thing I too is, yeah, we're yeah. reverse, reversing <laughs> yeah, right. here. You, you should be protected you yeah. should be yeah no <laughs> it's, it's, i think it's important for creators to know it is, the yeah. other aspect You're too right. is is you look at mr beast like single point of failure right 
Like mm. Kim Kardashian has like certain aspects of her, you know, insured just in case stuff happens, right? Whether yeah. they have heard that, that actually may not be true. Um, but the same thing if Mr. Beast were to get hit by a bus, Carl's not going to take over. Maybe. I think a lot of people like Carl. Uh, he's a cool guy. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very high risk factor. Whereas like with, with a software development team, if you have one, that's actually a problem. If you have one engineer that knows everything and then they quit or they, they get hit by a bus, there's a lot of like technical debt or whatever that needs to be overcome, right? And I think that would be a risk factor as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, that actually does, I think that it's not a double standard where if it's a single point of failure that could, if they just decide they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, creators are, are notably like, you know, uh, fickle, is that what it is? I think fickle is the right word. Where like, hey, we're, and they have to be because, you know, if you, you can't be too invested in your content strategy and your way you do things because Meta might change this algorithm tomorrow and you have to do, now you got to do long form and now they yeah. don't want photo posts and now they do want photo posts, you know, so you kind of got to just be able to go with the flow. And, and creators or creatives who tend to be more, you know, go with the flow kind of people. Um, so completely devil's advocate. I, I think that again, creators, they create so much value, entertainment value. There's, there's more, more viewing hours. I think very recently, I shared this at the Creator Economy Summit. Very recently, um, more hours are being viewed of YouTube content than television. That doesn't surprise me yeah. one bit. Yeah, so they, they create so much value and entertainment value. I haven't had cable or whatever forever. Um, and they're not being compensated properly, but it's because of the, the frameworks are not in place right. to give them a stable career, to give them stable income, to give them provable, I create this much value in this, in this world, you know? And is that something that's bound imminent to happen or do you reckon it's gonna take more time? Like, are those frameworks coming? Yeah, I'd say so, we're launching today. <laughs> yes, yes, you're launching your <laughs> yeah, contribution. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's our hope is really to make it, you know, very, uh, very visible, very attributable, very, you know, everybody can say I created this much value, you know, and, yeah. and not overcharge for the value they're created and not, not leave money on the table, you know. Okay, so, but your, your product aside, right? Is I'm there maybe a little any, biased. Yeah, is there anything that you've seen as trends, as pushing the creator economy in a sense towards more being more established, more uh, recognized and so on. Yeah, I think a lot of creators are venturing out. They're realizing that, you know, um, brand deals, platform monetization up and down. Um, and it's you can't really build a, a life. You can't plan years in advance uh, with that. So they're venturing out to build their own things, whether it's community, whether it's e-commerce product, whether, you know, it's, it's their teaching, coaching. I think that creators are looking to build their own and leverage their influence more. Um, so that's, I think that even venture is starting to see creator economy as something. But what I was really curious and, and wondering about is whether you see a, an obvious trend towards, you know, the, the creator economy moving into a, a place of um, validation and um, acceptance from the rest of our society and economy and so on. And because, you know, we're talking about, well, it's still not a legitimate thing. Like banks don't give you money, VCs eh, don't have anything for you and so on. It's still kind of like this obscurity in a sense of, a, yeah. of an economy. Um, and my, well, I was curious, if, apart from what you're doing. Yeah, right, let's say I get hit by a bus today. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. What, have you seen any other trends or any other initiatives that are pushing towards legitimizing uh, creators yeah. as, as a business, right? And seeing it as a business. Yeah, I think uh, as far as initiatives, you know, there's, there's plenty of startups I found at the Creator Economy Summit that were like kind of creating a landing pad for us. So like if you, you can, if you can get your audience to hear, like we'll help you build your community and stuff like that. I think that it kind of plays into where creators, what I said previously, that creators are looking to build um, their own thing. And in general, I think, you know, Mr. Beast, this huge deal with Amazon, uh, I think as more of these things hit the news and assuming that that's a success, which of course it will be, um, at least that's how I feel, uh, that more, you know, um, I, I think where the money flows is where it's going to go. And so if, if creators are able to show like, hey, we could get a small piece of this, we want to produce our own shows. And actually a lot of creators are doing that now. They're, they're creating their own kind of show content, more long form. Um, I think it will be 
more legitimized the the you know when they can kind of say that you know for example we just had that inflection point rather of, of uh where creators are now commanding more viewing hours i think those sort of metrics those sort of milestones are, are going to solidify more and, and again there's companies that are working to solve this and it, it's a huge problem just like i said the attribution problem is a big problem to solve helping creators because they do create tremendous value if they can give them access to funding or help them legitimize um you know what they're doing i think that's kind of we, we need more news articles we need more more things events happening of uh i would say more milestones less initiatives of you know mr beast getting that deal or, or even smaller creators getting deals doing travel shows and and stuff like that um because a lot of people who follow a creator doing travel content on instagram yeah. would watch their show on you know uh HBO, whatever it might be, um, they they would follow that. Oh, that makes sense. Um, and I think you're you. That's a sense of what has happened with other industries or other um, economies that have been a bit of obscure and get kind of like putting a spotlight on on that and having events and growing it as well. You know, now it becomes a standard that's. A, it's a normal thing to do this thing. Um, I'm still not sure whether <laughs> it is a complete no-no to call um, creators influencers or not. I, I don't that's, mind. That's, I feel that that's self-imposed, right? Yeah. Don't call me an influencer, call yeah. me a, a, a content creator or a creator. Look, I think we've had a really good conversation around the topic that you're super passionate yes. about, yeah, yeah. which is... Which is um, you know, creators and helping brands um, build better relationships and, and build a better economy around, um, you know, brand creator relationship yeah. and so on. It seems like you're very passionate about it. And this is a topic that I'm interested in, like I'm creating content and, I, and I've always been interested in, uh, in this topic. So it's been maybe a tiny bit less about your um, founder path in a sense, more about the, the topic um, that you're into, but I do have a question because I'm interested in in how, what exactly is it that moves the needle for you? Hmm. So my question is, so you, you've, been, you've been a model, then you transitioned into uh, social media, doing mainly social, social media stuff, um, started your agency because you had friends and more friends of friends that wanted help with social media yeah. as well. Um, and now you're starting a product business. So if you've had this transition, what has been, and the first thing that comes into your head, what, what has been a one constant for you as a, as a professional, of someone that's, you know, grew up, moved to LA and started this whole Mm -hmm. craziness of a, of a journey that got you to this project. What was one constant that you can think of? I'd say freedom. Freedom has been a really big thing. Um, and it's something I've, I've chased after and willing to kind of give up being comfortable. A lot of times we're doing well in LA um, and, you know, itching to, to go somewhere, do something. And uh, having the freedom to be able to do that was more meaningful than the, the comfort. So a lot mm -hmm. of times, you know, we'd probably be a lot further if I had stayed in LA the past eight years, um, potentially, like professionally, maybe. But where I kind of, I, I want to kind of experience everything and, and not, and, and you know, not, not really leave anything on the table. So having the freedom to be able to travel um, and prioritizing experiences over comfort, I think has been, and let me be clear, when I went to Bali, I did not have a good time because it was very uncomfortable and it was an uncomfortable experience. But I think just being able to kind of do whatever whatever I want and, and whatever I feel like will, will push the needle. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And do you feel like with the agency, do you still, do you feel like you have freedom? Because the one thing that I, that I realize is with services businesses and, and agencies and so on, once you get in the world of helping customers yep. and being there and doing yeah. things for them, does that still feel feel like you having a lot of flexibility and freedom um, with doing things? Yeah. How, how, does that how does that freedom translate to a services business, for example? That, that's a great question. And I would say, you know, 
when you have an agency, you're answering to clients, um, and especially clients, you know, um, it definitely, you do have to compromise a bit of that freedom. Um, I, I found personally, you know, I, I prefer working with clients that I really align with that I, you know, we kind of create value with. So I had a lot less, you know, my goal was never to, you know, I've never paid a dollar for customer acquisition. Like it's always been referrals and intros because people that I help them do well, they connect me with someone. We have a level of trust. They'll let me do what I do. And, you know, you do get the people that'll text you on a Sunday at, you know, 7 PM and say, Hey, I need you to do this, 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 this. Um, but at the same time, you know, it kind of gave me the, the ability to say like, no, <laughs> or, yeah. or hire a team. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely go definitely, back to your weekend and leave me alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I will say like, I, you know, naturally I like helping people and I, I kind of have to remind myself, like not light myself on fire to keep other people warm. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it's a good, it's a good analogy. <laughs> light myself up <laughs> on fire to, to keep others uh warm okay yeah it's it's you know so i i try to put like i with the marketing agency you know I, the way that i've come always done everything and it's worked really well is like give so much away for free information or or value or helping people so that they're like oh this is alex hormozy talks about this where if if you give all that for free people are like oh my god if this is the free stuff like i can't imagine how much i get from paying or they'll realize like this looks like a lot of work i'd so much rather pay you to do it um, and yeah, I think like learning to kind of duplicate yourself. So with the agency, I have an ops manager. He's phenomenal. Um, brought him on recently as we were scaling. Um, you know, it's always I've, I've hired virtual assistants. I've hired employees. Um, you know, trying to be very systematic. I think has has helped. But I would be lying if I if I said that uh, I, I had freedom in my own way. I might work a sixteen hour days, but I'm choosing to work sixteen hour days. Mm. You know, because I'm like, hey. I like freedom, but I like staying at the Ritz when I travel, <laughs> you know, so not every time, but like, I love, I yeah, love, yeah. you know, finer things too. So, you know, like if I want to have this and I was always raised that way, my parents didn't really give me anything. Um, as far as like, you know, if we go on a school field trip and I'm like, yeah, dad, we're going snowboarding. He's like, that's awesome. How are you going to pay for that? You know, <laughs> which I hated as a kid, but like it taught me to be resourceful. So, you know, it's kind of the thing, like, it, you know, it's not greedy if yeah. you're willing to work for it and, and you provide value to others to get it. So, uh, you know, I, I would work 16 hour days, much to the chagrin of, of my girlfriend, definitely, but I still had that freedom because I could choose. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's what some people confuse, confuse um, basically freedom with um, amount of white space mm. in a sense, Yeah. right? It's like oh oh well you're working you're working twelve hours per day when you're in business that's not freedom right because you don't like you don't spend you should have you should have more free time mm -hmm. like kind of like white space in a sense yeah and that's what some people associate with freedom I I I completely agree with you yeah. right like I feel completely free I don't I can be working twelve hours per day. But I know that at any point, I can just shut that laptop down. You can create the white space. And, and create the exactly. white space. Right? Yeah. And, and that's what people don't really understand. I mean, not like there's, of course, people that don't understand that. But there's a lot of people that, that look at you working 12 hours and say, oh, my God, he's in shackles. Mm -hmm. The reality is not that whatsoever. It's, and it's because the perception of that white space. And, you know, if you see someone that's, that's, you know, because we're talking about uh, content creators yeah, and yeah. social media. And so I see someone always on holiday driving, you know, super expensive cars and taking pictures with watches and those 24 yeah. seven, you have the false perception of exactly. that being freedom, mm -hmm. right? When in reality, it might be completely opposite. It might, you yeah. might have, we might have someone that's kind of like a, in a sense, in shackles of having to create that content or Absolutely. or else it doesn't become, you know, they don't have certain means. Yep. And then you might see someone that never posts anything or let's say is a very busy entrepreneur or spending hours and hours at events and this and that and working hard. And it's like, oh, that guy has zero spare time. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's seasonal agree. too, right? I think, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we go through a season of we work super hard on this thing or, or just in general work super hard. 
And then sometimes, you know, personally, this is maybe just a me thing, um, but sometimes there, there'll be like a few days where I'm just like, eh, and I just, you know, I don't. And so I but hang out and, and then I get back into it, you know. But isn't that just burnout? Like, <laughs> there's, there's, there's different, different ways you can call it. Die a thin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's for me, like, I've always been a sprinter instead of a marathon runner. And I think that that's more, it's, that's an incredible skill to be able to like just maintain consistency. It's something I struggle with, you know, I, I'm ADHD and everybody's ADHD, but like, you know, it, that's something else that I'm kind of passionate about that like I have ADHD and it's, it's, it's awesome in some ways, but like it, it can be really frustrating. Um, and you know, so it's, I, I've learned, you learn to, to the medicine helps, but then also you learn to kind of cope. And, and what I've kind of learned is I'm not the person who's going to have the, the, you know, wake up at 4 a.m., do read, do journal for 30 minutes, and then do ice bath for an hour and tch, 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 every single day. Um, you know, that's just not how I'm effective because that's where I get burnout, believe it or not, from the, doing the consistently. But if I know, like, hey, I just have to sprint for this next two weeks and then I'm chilling or, like, you know, we're going we're gonna to launch or we're going to get a new client or whatever, you know, this amazing project, that for me allows me to, what I would say, avoid burnout. Um, you know, I still get it, but I, I think... I've been fortunate that, you know, I'm a kind of passionate person, so I, I can bounce back rather quickly, you know. Oh, that makes sense. And I, and I, uh, I kind of agree. I think over uh, as a serial burnouter, <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> as a serial burnouter, because I like, I've always like just put 120% and yeah. then crash of tiredness and have to recover and yeah. then just go 120 percent i think you get into a cycle where it doesn't it's, it's not burnout anymore because you get used to how much yeah. you can cope with over a period of time yeah and you kind of like do that and then take it slower and then go back to your you know 110 percent yeah that you don't go 120 to burn yeah. out yeah exactly you, you know your upper limits for sure yeah, exactly. i used to work until like 4 a.m. a lot of times and I then found that the periods of burnout I have would be a lot worse mm -hmm. and so now I'm like actually for me I've found specifically that sleep I have to get my eight hours like I can actually I, I really can function on two hours of sleep and I can do that for like days and days but if I do that when I do hit the wall it's bad you know and, and I think also something to say with burnout like you look at your life right I'm, I'm 27 um I I have my freedom but I I work harder than I honestly, I struggle to think of people that like are constantly always thinking about work in the same way I am, um, even though, of course, I take breaks. But you can do that for a period of your life. And that, that's kind of my path as a founder is I want to create value and, and build name for myself and establish myself and then really being able to focus as I turn 30, 35, 40, I don't care how long it takes. After that point, I've, I've done that. And then I can only do the things that I'm excessively passionate about. Um, so I think you can also go really hard for a period of a chapter of your life, you know, and you can break it up into micro chapters where like, hey, this chapter 21 to 22, I'm going to chill 22 to 23. I'm going to work super hard, you know, but that's kind of always been my thought is, is sacrificing now. I want to have kids someday, but I don't want to be working or having to work or miss my kids like basketball games. And, and that's my own thing. Like no, no shame to like parents who are making it work and obviously working super hard. I, my best friend back in Arizona has a kid and he works, you know, super hard. It's awesome. Um, but that, that's another thing that drives me is like clock's ticking, you know, <laughs> it's gotta, I don't got time to chill you yeah. know, if I want to have kids. True. Well, very true. Yeah. Well, I, I think you looks like you're on the path to it. Um, it's, it, it's kind of been the same. I've, I've, I've been the same. I've been a, you know, just dedicate, sacrifice, my 20s in order to make something happen it, it, it happened at 35 ish mm -hmm. right like it, it took a while but you know i'm in a place where i do the stuff that i really passionate about right what now. was it that happened for you um well i i built a, a software as a service business and i sold it um and at the end of 2022 yeah. and that gave me the financial freedom to, you know, do the stuff that I really love, like 
helping other founders through, through the podcast, yep. focus on on the creative side and filmmaking and other bits that, you know, it was a bit of questionable decision to take in my 20s when, you know, you have to choose between making, trying to make money and so on and versus the more creative artsy side of yourself, right? So now I'm at, I'm at a stage where like, okay, I can focus more on the artsy side of yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, that's ex exactly. So that, that's, I think a lot of people, they, they look at the micro, like in this season of your life, and you can look at the macro of like, how do you, if you make kind of a plan for your life, I've always, I've always kind of known that uh, eventually I'll have that level of freedom, like full freedom to, to really like not consider financial aspect of any of my you know, endeavors, but um, it's always kind of been just something I work on now. And I think a lot of people don't look at that. Um, and, and they'll look at like, you know, Elon Musk, who obviously has an incredible financial freedom, could do anything. And, and he happens to be driven to, you know, whether, whatever you think of Elon Musk, like he's, he's driven towards, you know, uh, massive fundamental progress and change, um, you know? And, and so I think they, people think that everybody, if you're working hard now, that that's your plan. And I'm not saying mine wouldn't be, I don't know, but, you know, I, I think also it's just, sacrificing in the, the interim so you can get to to that end goal you know yeah well we're aligned with that and if you calculate it afterwards when when that happens and you get to that point it will be oh well i've spent this many years and this much of my time and so on and now i have a family i'm raising my children the way I've always dreamed of. Was that period worth it? Most 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 often you realize that yes. Because mm -hmm. again, that's you know, that's been for us as well. Like I've had, I've lost so many friends and I've I've been through so many things um over the in my because I've started in, in at twenty and you know, I've tried so many things and tried to build something until thirty something, spent ten years of my life doing this. A lot of people told said it's just madness and all of that stuff. Lost a lot of friends or people in my life because of things like this. Because you know, no one's every, everyone's on their own path, and a lot of people that you meet want you to be there, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I can't be there for this type of relationship, friends wise or so on, over this period, because I need to build yeah. for the future that. I'm envisioning. So it's been that, but you know, at the end of it was super worth it because I'm in the place that I've always pictured and I'm surrounded by the people that have been there with me through the journey and that, you know, believed in the stuff. And I was actually having a conversation with someone the other day about, you know, when you're head down in doing some of this stuff, even the closest to you, like your parents and so on, can be like, maybe you should get a job, but yeah. just... my mom, every time we FaceTime, my mom <laughs> says, you have tired eyes. <laughs> every time, <laughs> like, those are my eyes now, mom. That's just how they are, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little heavier. What are your thoughts on, you know, I, I would never use the word lucky, but like the people who aren't so fortunate that they do work very hard and never get that breakthrough. Well, I think it's a very abstract thing because luck is part of it, mm. right? And, but I think you also, over time, you make your luck. Mm -hmm. Like, the more, the more you work towards it, the more options you build for yourself, the less luck you need, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, you're, you're increasing your exposure to yeah, luck. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Either that or you don't leave that much to, to luck. Yep. If someone becomes a, a billionaire at 21, 22, I'll be like, stroke of genius or incredible luck for all of the stars to align to get. Yeah. That, that, that's my... Yeah. Um, let's call it knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. because you're 21. Like you've not had time to yeah. build a, a network and a structure around yourself that enables you to win big with very little to do 
with luck, right? When you have relationships, when you have friends, when you have connections, when you have a, a vast experience in fucking up, right, yeah. in business, yep. then you're treading on stabler ground, right? So there's always there's a there's there's a factor of luck, I would say, and, and fortune. But as you grow older, I would say that that factor of luck can be lesser yeah, right. in order to to become successful. Right. And I think that's what You need more luck yeah. when you're younger than you do when you're older. That's exactly yeah, what happened absolutely. to me, right? Yeah. So like I've tried to, since, since I was 17, when I started my first business, to try to make it happen, to make it big, to become successful and so on. It, it happened at 35, right? More than 15, 16 years later, because I had terrible luck. Yeah. And and I I've had more luck now, but also I've had a, a a baggage of other factors that contributed to me being successful. Because if I was lucky, but didn't have a lot of the experience and a lot of the, the foundation foundation yeah. of it, it wouldn't have amounted to much mm -hmm. that luck. So yes, it is, and I also know scenarios and people that have been working for a decade or more and. It yeah. never happened for them. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a lot about how you're trading things. And, and I think as an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to, and a founder, you have to be willing to, at the end of the day, when the party's over, to be the last one there and be the unlucky person. And like, like it, to, to really be willing, I think just like kind of leave it all on the table. And that's kind of my perspective. So I, I'd rather be 65 and be like, ah, I should have. I should have been an accountant, you know, <laughs> like and had a state, you know, whatever. I'd I'd rather do that than sixty five an accountant. And not to say that I think accountants are fantastic, but like personally, uh, you know, it'd be like, oh man, I really wish I would have like chased my dreams. Yeah. Um <laughs> that's a very interesting bit. <laughs> Imagine you're 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 on your deathbed and be like, Oh my god, I've been I've been chasing the founder dream for for eighty years. Should have taken a job, <laughs> goddammit. Yeah. And your mom would be like, I told you so. <laughs> oh, the best, the best time of my life was my family, uh, extended family, stopped like hinting towards like, you should get a real job or like, you know, I didn't go to school. Um, so also, you know, it, it, that was for the longest time. I think maybe when I, maybe it was when I turned around 23 that that stopped kind of echoing. And I don't think negatively of school just, you know, wasn't the right path for me. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, you, going back to my point, that's kind of, I think you, it, it takes that to be very successful in this. Yeah. It's just that knowledge. It's never been a question for me that like, I'm going to figure it out. Like I'm okay with having like a, you know, 1% batting average, right? I'll just make sure I hit a hundred times, you know? And I've done that. I've done, I, in 2019, Instagram massively changed their algorithm and my business completely crashed. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, Instagram was starting to do their AR filters that you could like, you know, you might've seen them where every kind of creator yeah. had their own filter. We're going to build a creative marketing agency around that. And I started doing that and built affiliate, built like I had a development team that was going to do it and uh, did not pan out. But it's like, okay, that didn't pan out. But like the next thing, like the next. And I think as long as you're willing to kind of be the, the one who doesn't make it at the end, as long as you're going to give your shot in the hopes that you are, I think yeah. that you have a very high chance because what is it like? whatever percentage of startups, you know, end up being successful, you just got to create a hundred startups and you're definitely gonna be successful, you know, uh, intelligent, obviously you can't really create a hundred good startups, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And when we was talking this with, um, AJ as well, it's like not feeling, not fearing failure that much. Yeah. You're always going to fear, um, failure. There's always going to be like, a and there's always going to be external factors. There's always going to be your grandma over there being like, well, you know, I always seen you as a doctor or something like that. There's always going to be some, some yep. sort of that. But I think, like you said, at the end of your life going, oh, I, got, I was an accountant, wish I was, would have chased my, my dreams. Who are you going to be most resent, resentful towards? Yep. Yourself first? And then all of the people that you listen to, listen to, and yeah. were too concerned of disappointing, yeah. Yeah. right? If it doesn't happen to you, so yeah, I think 
and and that's one of the things that I think you're doing and a lot of people have have been doing that and and with good reason is take your parents and your family and your close ones advice digest it but at the end of the day you do mm-hmm. what you have to do yep. um and not get concerned about what others will say. Uh, you know, I've had, I still have moments where fleeting moments where I think, you know, but I'm getting into a different industry, right? I should be a serial entrepreneur and doing the same thing, go down that down this path, make something way bigger, more successful, and so on. Because well, you can the, when you're you're leading yourself open to it. Like yeah. if it, if you find the opportunity, you have this stroke of genius at some point, you know, then you can, right? And I mean, and to your point before, you can, you can, uh, I think for me, what, what kind of guided me is whether I listen to their advice and that I should do X, Y, Z, or this is the right way of doing things and I don't make it, or if I do make it, they're still going to have feelings about my success. Mm. You know, they might say, oh, you were lucky or, oh, this, and it's, it's oh, just, yeah. I think it's just in general, you have to like, like you, you shouldn't like mute them, but like, just turn it down a bit. Like, like you said, digest it, but no matter where you end up on that map, like people are always gonna have an opinion, yeah. you know? And next time you go home for, um, for holidays or something like that, if you see your parents um, giving you the side eye about your business, yeah. Yeah, yeah fortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm muting you, I'm, yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm putting the volume down, okay? Yeah, I, I'd say I'm, I'm fortunate with my parents, like they, they do support whatever I do, like, you know, uh, emotionally, like, you know, they'll, they'll be there for me to vent and, and uh, I'm really fortunate for that, you know? Um, they've kind of let me choose and they had their feedback, of course, but you know, my, my dad's parents came from Cuba and they're big on the American dream. My dad was as well, but his parents were teachers. They raised him to be a teacher and he always had his like harebrained scheme business ideas growing up and we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was like 10, you know? Um, and he kind of like was really pushing on that. So yeah. There's certain things I disagree with, definitely, that, that the way they believe in, in business and that sort of stuff, but yeah. Well, it's always good to have a supportive um, family. Absolutely. And um, I'm sure that you're going to reach a point not very far in the future where you'll be like, I still have that freedom. I yeah. can still spend time with my children, future mm-hmm. children and so on, and go to their games and be a, the father that I want that I always wanted to be um, because again I think it's not thinking of these things and not preparing for these things that one day you, you reach a point and think god damn it I didn't thought this through look at me I'm like I, I have this crazy business that that yep. keeps me shackled and I'm missing on my family events and seeing my kids and being part of my kids growing up and all of this stuff. Um, and usually it happens way later when it's too late. Yep. Right. Like yep. I, I know people in my life that have been doing that. Um, not to give names, <laughs> um, but the fact that you are actively and very consciously working towards that that right now it means that you're gonna make it yes make sure that that luck happens as you just well. gotta get in the right <laughs> loom and then the right room and then, and then the luck comes, exactly you know? the luck is necessary but you know being super proactive about chasing that dream of one day you know i'll have my family over here and i'm gonna be able to have continue to have this flexible lifestyle where I can be with them whenever I want to. That's a really, I would say, a, a proper dream to, to chase. Um, and thank you so much for doing this. I probably should let you go at <laughs> that stock. You're probably sitting here. Oh, I missing, gotta get in those rooms. No, I'm this missing, is fantastic. I'm missing another uh, talk and I need to get to those rooms and have the conversation. They're recording. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate the conversation. Um, looking forward to potentially have another conversation somewhere in the future. We've talked a lot about, about the content creator bit, a tiny bit about your <laughs> entrepreneurship journey, but yeah. uh, 
let's see, maybe next year for a SAS two-parter, talk, two-parter yeah, podcast. Yeah. SAS talk, we meet again, and you tell me um, how you feel about uh, your business at that point. Uh, are you um, punching the air or not? Oh yeah, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. Cheers. Thank awesome. You. Thanks so much.